I love an unsolved mystery in physics, mainly because I just love talking about the stuff that we don't know, right? Those are my favorite bits of science. That's what research is after all. Now, because my research is, you know, galaxies and supermassive black holes, things that are, you know, millions to billions of light years away, I often fall into the trap of thinking that compared to the many, 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 many things that we don't know about the universe as a whole, we know a lot more about our own backyard of the universe, you know, the solar system. But I'd be so wrong because there's so much that we still don't know about our own solar system. And in particular, what's going on at the edge of the solar system, you know, the the far end of the backyard that you can't quite see from the house. And in particular, there is an unexplained excess of particles in a ribbon reflecting back at us that we cannot explain. All right, this odd ribbon of particles is known as the Ibex ribbon, named after the satellite that first detected it, the Interstellar Boundary Explorer, which was launched back in 2008 and has been detecting particles from the edge of the solar system ever since. Now, the particles that it detects are called ENAs, energetic neutral atoms. But what are they and where do they come from? So we define the edge of the solar system as where particles which are streamed off by the sun impact with particles from interstellar space. So in the very under dense gas that you find between stars. Now, if you remember the Voyager crafts actually crossed that boundary a couple of years ago now, sort of recording the number of particles detected from the sun and the number of particles that you could detect from interstellar space and seeing one drop and one increase as they crossed that boundary. Essentially, the particles that are streamed out by the sun form a protective bubble around the solar system, which we call the heliosphere. Now, the sun is mostly made of hydrogen, right? So as you can imagine, most of the particles in this solar wind that's streamed off the sun is also hydrogen. They're incredibly energetic and they move incredibly fast through space. They're also ionized atoms, which means that instead of having the electron orbiting the proton, the proton and the electron are free to move about however they want to. So you have free floating positive and negative ions. That's something we call a plasma. Now this plasma in the solar wind is essentially what forms this protective bubble around the solar system, this heliosphere that protects us from the very worst of cosmic rays and radiation. Now at the very edge of that bubble of the heliosphere where the solar wind plasma meets this very under dense gas of the interstellar medium just made of very like low energy atoms of hydrogen and helium, the sort of maybe a couple of the heavier elements you can have a collision of one of these plasma ions with these slow moving atoms. Now, if that happens, you can have what's called a charge exchange take place between them. It's a really fancy way of saying that the ion comes in and steals an electron from the atom. And then that ion goes back to being a neutral hydrogen atom, but it doesn't lose any energy in that process. So what you've essentially created is a very energetic neutral atom, an ENA, and you've left behind a very slow moving ion in the interstellar medium. Essentially what happens is you reflect back the energy or the solar wind of the sun and turn it from plasma into neutral atoms at that boundary. You can think of it as kind of like an echo of the solar wind of the sun bouncing back towards us. So these ENAs is what Ibex actually is able to detect. And it's not easy. First of all, because the count rate is just really low. It only detects something like 600 or so of these particles per day. And that's it. The other difficult thing is that UV photons can mimic the same signature as what an ENA produces in the detector. So UV light from the sun. And those count rates are anything from sort of like a thousand to 10 million <laughs> times the ENA rate that it's counting per day. Also, you've got to keep out charged particles as well. You've got to measure the mass and the energy of the ENA coming in. You have got to be able to measure the direction that the ENA comes from as well. Because if you don't know the direction it's come from, that's not helpful. And you've got to do all of that on a satellite that's easy enough to launch into space. So 
it's definitely not one of the easiest things that you can do in space, but NASA managed to do it with the IBEX detector. It's not perfect, it could be improved and hopefully it will be improved upon on the future. So the direction that the particles are coming from, it's very difficult to actually get at that. So the precision is not great. It means that the maps of where these particles are coming from in the sky are quite grainy than sort of we're used to seeing with these super high resolution, say, telescopes that work, you know, with actual light rather than just detecting neutral atoms. But despite that though, in November 2009, IBEX released its very first results from its observations running through 2009 and found something completely unexpected and inexplicable. To put this into context, what people expected was a fairly uniform signal, right? The sun is a sphere and it outputs these plasma solar wind particles in all directions away from that sphere. And the interstellar gas pervading stars was not thought to really vary that much either. So it was expected that it was gonna be a uniform signal that really only had sort of like statistical fluctuations in it. Instead, they found what was dubbed by Christina Prested, a grad student on the team at the time, a ribbon around the sky where the amount of these energetic neutral atoms, these ENAs that they were detected, was two to three times higher in intensity than everywhere else on the sky. Now you should note that it's an arc shape in these images because we're taking something that's a 3D sphere on the sky and projecting it down to something flat. So you will have noticed this before if you've seen images from sort of mission control on satellite or rocket launches where they have the orbit of the rocket or the satellite sort of overlaid on a map of the Earth, which is a 3D sphere that's projected down into two dimensions. And you'll see that even though the rocket is just taking, you know, straight line orbit around the Earth, when you plot that overlaid on a 2D map of Earth, it turns into sort of a sine wave. And it's the same thing you've got here. You've got this Ibex ribbon that's coming from sort of a plane in space, which then when you project it down onto 2D, you get this sort of like sine wave arc shape. Now there's been many different hypotheses posed over the years to try and explain the Ibex ribbon. The discovery paper back in 2009 led by McComas and collaborators gave six different suggestions for how this thing could have been made. Now one of the more popular suggestions from that paper that people have sort of ran with over the years is that it's caused by the intersection of the heliosphere with the galactic magnetic field. So just like how the Earth has a magnetic field and the Sun has a magnetic field, so too does the galaxy. So the magnetic field can act a little bit like a mirror, reflecting more of these particles back into the solar system where this solar wind plasma intersects this magnetic field. So where any of these plasma particles actually make it out and past the boundary of the heliosphere and into interstellar space, they can actually sort of get funneled by the magnetic field lines until they're actually orbiting the magnetic field lines. And whilst they're doing that, if they still end up impacting with, uh, you know, a neutral atom in the interstellar medium, then again, they can have this charge exchange where they steal an electron. Thing is, once they then do that, they become neutral and neutral particles aren't affected by magnetic fields. And so as they've been orbiting and orbiting and orbiting these magnetic field lines sort of trapped there, as soon as that happens, they're then sort of released from that orbit. So it's a little bit like releasing a discus and they're released in a straight line essentially from this magnetic field line, which is why you get sort of this amplified signal supposedly where the heliosphere intersects this magnetic field. This was modeled back in 2010 by Hirak Hewson and they showed that you could really clearly get that sort of arc-like shape and this ribbon shape if that was actually occurring. And then further work by Schwadrum and McComas in 2013 showed that plasma particles would essentially get trapped in these orbits around these magnetic field lines. And you sort of get this buildup of plasma particles over time and that would explain why you've got this overly amplified signal over sort of, you know, the general background that you see in the rest of the sky of these ENAs from this specific location where the heliosphere meets this galactic magnetic field of the Milky Way. But there is another hypothesis floating around astrophysics circles that's gaining in popularity as well that could explain what's going on at the edge of the solar system, but also have an impact possibly on future intrepid Martian astronauts. Right. 
Let's do the math. So this one says, instead of the solar system moving through generic, boring, old, average, interstellar medium, it's actually about to enter a large nebula of hot, dense gas that's called the local bubble. The ribbon reveals where the edge of the heliosphere is currently intersecting with the edge of the local bubble. So detecting the Ibex ribbon could be sort of our first warning signal of this because to see it so clearly already must mean we're well on our way to becoming part of the bubble. So people have actually calculated that perhaps even in a hundred years, the solar system could be fully embedded in this local bubble. Now, there's nothing to worry about necessarily. We think that the solar system has passed through similar regions of sort of hot, dense gas uh, nebulas before. All it would mean is that the heliosphere would, first of all, probably shrink just a little bit, just sort of dealing with that pressure of that hot gas outside of it, but also that the amount of cosmic radiation and cosmic rays that make it into the solar system would probably increase, which means that anybody outside of that sort of second layer of protection of the Earth's atmosphere would need to take precautions. So anybody on the International Space Station, for example, anybody perhaps setting up future lunar bases on the moon, or perhaps any future Mars colonizers would also need to take this into account and think about how they could mitigate for the effects of cosmic rays and radiation. I know that was low on the list of priorities for Mark Watney, but I'm guessing space agencies will probably care about it. But that's only if this hypothesis turns out to be true, which, you know, this thing is still an unsolved mystery. So the local bubble hypothesis, the magnetic mirror hypothesis, or any of the other five hypotheses that were raised in that first discovery paper, you know, none of those are accepted theory yet. As always, we need more data. And crucially, we need to observe whether this Ibex ribbon is changing over time. So if we observe, you know, within the next century or so that the Ibex ribbon is growing, then perhaps that will give a lot more weight to this idea of we're moving into this local bubble region of space of this, you know, nebula of hot, dense gas. But if it stays fairly constant with time and doesn't change, then perhaps we'll favor the galactic magnetic field, this magnetic mirror sort of hypothesis. And maybe it'll shrink with time and we'll have to come up with a completely new hypothesis to explain it. Until we have that data though, this Ibex ribbon is gonna remain one of those weird and wonderful unsolved mysteries. Quick ad break before we get to the bloopers. I just want to say thank you to this week's video sponsor, Brilliant. Brilliant is a website with problem solving courses that get you to learn by doing rather than just by watching YouTube videos. The courses are really interactive and fun and they break things down into easy to understand chunks. Ultimately, they teach you how to think logically, like a scientist, so you know how to approach a problem that you're trying to solve. If you're interested in how scientists come up with hypotheses to explain things like the Ibex ribbon, Brilliant has a great course on scientific essentials that covers, you know, not just the science basics, like the difference between ions and atoms or the states of matter, like the plasma we talked about in the solar wind, but also the organization of knowledge in science and how to design an experiment to test a new hypothesis as well. If that course sounds good to you, then head over to brilliant.org forward slash Dr. Becky, that's D-R-B-E-C-K-Y, and sign up for free. And the first 200 of you to go to that link will also get 20% off an annual premium subscription. So if you like the sound of that, then head over there and say a big thank you from me. Particles which are streamed off by the sun impact with particles from interspeller, interspeller? interspeller space. <laughs> puts this solar wind in all directions away from that sp sphere. Sp sphere? Beep, 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 beep. Sphere, not spear. We're not talking about weaponry from like Lord of the Rings. Different ways of explaining this thing. Sam? Oh, I thought you were upstairs. I kept seeing a shadow move under the door and I got a bit freaked out. I thought you were out. I'm thinking about the magnetic mirror, oh yeah, I'm asking it to reflect Ionet. <laughs> I've got, I'm, I'm 
quite overly proud of that one, I've got to admit. 